thanks everybody for coming. For those who know me, I'm Ken Graham. For those who don't, I'm Tiger Woods. <laughs> wish. I just wish I had one of his paychecks. Like that lasts me about ten years. Anyway, now I on the boards I'm known as Yellow Dog. I've tried to keep that name consistent. Leftover from the old Usenet days. Um, for, the, for those of you who are old enough to remember Usenet, the old wreck that, whatever. But uh, back in the, in the bad old days, I was a programmer at Williams for about a year. And to answer the question everybody asked, yes, it was the most amazing job in the world. You actually got paid to do something fun. Uh, but it really wasn't so much what we were doing, because we were putting in stupid hours, I mean, 15, 20 hours a day on this stuff. But it was the fact that I was working with a bunch of people that were, I would consider, certifiable geniuses. And when you think about it, the early 80s, half the TVs in the U.S. were still black and white. You know, and here's these guys putting images on the screen, and they're actually doing something you know, and you get to play with it and all the physics that goes into it that nobody thinks about. You know, if you've ever, ever sat down and thought about it, go play a game of Robotron, get yourself up to the 30th or 40th level or find somebody who can do it like Dave Garcia and then take over for him. Um, the amount of stuff that's going on on the screen is just simply astounding. When you consider that's a one megahertz chip with 64K of memory available to it. My watch has more than that. If any of you have smartphones, they're almost all at least one gigahertz ARM chips now. You know, 64-bit ARM chips. It's an 8-bit chip. You know, you're, you're, you're talking of one megahertz to one gigahertz. That's a thousand times faster. Everybody has at least four gig on their phone now. So what I don't know what that is, 4,000 times more memory? I mean, we take it all for granted, but back then, I mean, we were, we were under a lot of constraints. So anyway, that's, that's sort of the, the quick overview. If you've been to one of my talks before, you know I have a topic, but I'm a lousy lecturer. I can't stand up here and talk for an hour. What I can do, though, is if you have questions, if I hit something and go, oh, hey, wait a minute, that sounds interesting, can we, we'll go off and talk about that. So I let you guys drive the conversation. When it gets quiet again, I'll go back to the main topic. This time around, the topic is power. I get a lot of questions about that because if you've got an arcade cabinet, if you think about the cabinet as a household, power is the mama. And if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You have to have that regulated, nice, five volts, depending on the machine, sometimes minus five, plus 12. But if you don't have that power set up, you got a piece of furniture. And it's a big piece of furniture that really doesn't have a lot of use unless you drill a hole in it, and put a bar in it, and hang your clothes on it. And it's sort of like a, a treadmill. You know, everybody buys a treadmill, and I'm going to get fit, I'm going to get jog, and I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to hang my clothes on it. So anyway, what I'm going to talk about is geared towards Williams power supplies, but all power supplies are basically the same. They take the, the little wall socket over there, 120 volts, used to be 110, now it's 120, some places it's 130. You need to know what it is. And converts that AC down into DC voltages that the computers can use. It'd be wonderful if, if the microprocessors could run that AC directly, but they can't. They use DC, the same voltages that you get out of batteries. Uh, for those of you who remember back your uh, high school electrical shop days, AC is the one that has the wave that goes this way. DC is the one that has the, the wave that goes that way. If it goes like this, you got to fix that because it's supposed to go mm, straight across. Anyway, um, I didn't bring any pinball power supplies because mainly the Williams power supplies were based off of the pinball power supplies. Pretty much when they went to 
the video games with Defender, they stole everything off the pinball line, which caused a lot of the friction between the pin, pinheads and the vidiots back in the day. Uh, pinball guys were all mad at the video guys, and the video guys were, were mad back just because they were being mad at. So. Um, anyway, this is the basic Defender power supply. Everybody's sort of familiar with it. The two big old heat sinks on it. Everybody looks at those and goes, really? I said, yeah, if you take this off, put a little little dish about that big round, put a little oil in it, put some popcorn on it, you'll have fresh popcorn. We always used to joke about cutting a hole in the side and making popcorn poppers out of these things. We'd have fresh popcorn at, at Williams. They all pretty much have the same basic pieces. There's a fuse block. Please, 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 please read the fuse sizes and get the right ones in. When people send these things to me to be repaired, the first thing I do is I pull whatever fuses are in there, get the magnifying glass out and look at them to see what... I have seen all the way up to 40 amp ceramic fuses in these puppies. Because the operators would just go, hey, it's popping a fuse, we'll put a bigger one in it. 8 amp, oh, that one popped, okay, 10 amp, bang. Hey, you got any of those 40s around? Yep, oh, okay, we're good, let's go. You know, and if you're drawing that much juice, there is something wrong. You know, you're, you're bordering on fires. And I've actually seen fires inside of cabinets. The other thing that you'll notice on a lot of them when they do that is on the back side, it'll be nice and toasty. Nice and, nice and uh, brown, sometimes shading right towards black, where it's almost on the edge of catching fire. I mean, it takes a lot to catch one of these boards on fire, but they will if you heat them hot enough. Anyway, the Defender power supply is pretty, pretty basic. Uh, AC comes in, it goes through the big bridge rectifier. These mothers get really hot. They get almost as hot as these guys do, but they didn't put the big fin power supplies, or uh, heat sinks on them, on these power supplies. Don't know why. There's also a smaller one. That one's for the plus 12 volt. And there's a little neat one hiding right down here that's for the uh, minus five volt. Mainly because most of the, the juice is going through, most of the amperage is going through the plus five volts. The other two are mainly for running the RAM and uh, powering the uh, uh, soundboard. After it goes through that, it goes up here in this section. There are two little chips. Those are the voltage regulators, LM723s, still easily gotten. Um, if you bought from Bob Roberts, please check the voltages after you plug them back in. Bob got a hold of a bunch of counterfeit chips a few years ago, and they're still floating around. I've gotten counterfeit chips. Basically what happens is that instead of being plus 5 volts, it comes out at uh, 4.7 volts, which is like just barely good enough to run. Um, plus 12 volt comes in about 11.3 volts which is a little less, I mean, the, the RAM is a little less sensitive to that than it is to the, the 5 volt. So if you get one of, one of Bob's or you, you order from, I'm not, well, all right, I'll name names, Unicorn, check the voltage after you replace it. Uh, the other thing, everybody goes, what about the big capacitors on there? What's that all about? Well, that's the same one that they had on the pinball machines. We're gonna warning science ahead. A real Mythbusters sign there. Um, the 6800 had a glitch in it. And that glitch was that when the power went down below five volts, it would randomly start writing into memory. Just random stuff. And it would do that for a couple milliseconds. Now, that's great, you know, who cares? ROM, ROM will ignore it. 
static ram. Static ram is in the CMOS that has your high scores, your uh, uh, settings, whatever else. Uh, that can be bad. So the engineering fix for that is to put these big 18,000 microfarad capacitors on the 5 volt. And so what happens is that when the, the voltages get cut off, it can power the board for a little while before it hits that 5 volt or a 4 and a half volt threshold. What they did is they also have a 12 volt unregulated, meaning there's no capacitors on it, it's, it's roughly 12 volts. And they have a circuit on there that looks for that. And so when that goes bam to zero, it kicks in a little circuit on the CMOS, the static RAM, to protect it. It puts it into memory protect mode. So the CPU could hit it all at once and it's just going to ignore it. It looks like ROM at that point. So that's why when uh, you get a Williams box and somebody's throwing a switching power supply in, every so often you lose your settings or you lose your high scores or you look in the high scores and it says, you know, that's what it is because the switching power supplies don't have that big reserve on the 5 volt. So when 12 volt goes down, 5 volt's gone down, and the CPU has a chance to just go, hey, I'm having fun, spraying, spraying the RAM with all kinds of, of weirdness. Now, does anybody know what one of these is? They're very rare. I happen to have two in my collection. This is what's known as a clamping circuit, sometimes known as a crowbar circuit. Basically, the two things under the heat sinks are silicon controlled rectifiers, SCRs. The rest of it is basically a, a resistor network so that if the voltage goes above, I think it's 5.4 volts, this kicks in and clamps it to ground, drops it. It, it shorts basically through the SCR to ground. The reason for that is that this didn't have it. And one of the common failure points on this was that, I think it's this one, one of these voltage regulators would fry. When it would fry, it would open the transistor. The transistor is running 27 volts on one side and the, the measured voltage on the other. So when it did that, it put 27 volts down your five volt line. Most chips don't like that. So it would, it would instantly fry most of the CPU, usually the, the uh, ROM board, and you would end up with a dead machine and a lot of repair bills. Their answer to that was to come up with this little guy which fits on the output like that. These were put out in the, the first of the Stargate run and in the make tracks. Um, but the reason I say these are fairly rare, operators looked at these and went, oh my god, it's another Galaga filter. Gone. So. Then they wondered why, sooner or later, their machines were fried. But again, they didn't care. They go, well, profits are down on this, throw it out anyway, I don't care. So the, when they redesigned the newer boards, this, is, this came out about the time Moon Patrol was coming out, the tail end of the Stargate run, all of Robotron, all of Joust, Sinistar, Bubbles, I think all the way up to Blaster. Blaster, half of it had a, a new, a, yet another redesigned board. Um, Joust 2, I think, was kind of mixed on these. Basically, these are the two. I had three hands, I could pull all of this up. These two are these two here. The little resistor network is the resistor network there. So that they built it onto the board. So if this board has that catastrophic failure, the clamping circuit will run that down so you won't fry your boards. But other than that, 
and the fact that they took the heat sinks off and moved them onto its own little module, it's exactly the same circuit. Uh, this is what we all call farm fresh. I have a, I have a box of, uh, of ugly hack power supplies that people have sent in to be fixed. Unfortunately, it's probably in the part of the garage I can't find. I can't get to because of some cabinets in the way, so I don't have any really, really good examples of operator hacks. I have this one, which uh, is a little hard to see, but normally this is the, the cable that comes from the heat sink assembly and it comes on, plugs on right there. But as you can see, a couple of wires have been uh, moved over and soldered on. The uh, output, or the output from the transformer, plugs onto this one. And you can kind of see there's a little piece of wire there. There were three or four wires that they had. The connector up here had burned. And so rather than doing the right thing and replace the whole connector. I just got the soldering iron out and soldered it right onto the headers. The quick fix, man. Let's get this baby back up and running. So 20 years later, when I get them, it's like, oh my god. And these are not the worst. I mean, I have seen. There, you would just, you would just shudder if you saw some of the things that have been done to these poor things. But it's just the whole idea, really. And, the, and like I said, this is just sort of the Williams implementation of it, is to be able to take that power from the wall socket and power your boards. Whether it's pinball boards, video game boards, redemption machine boards, um, you know, or whatever. Even your, your uh, the little, little guy that plugs into the bottom of your smartphone does exactly the same thing. It takes that wall and they just transform it down into a usable power. So if you've all, I guess probably all of us have gone out and gotten barn fresh video games. You know, the operator, something happened, he put it into his storage and forgot about it for 20 years and his son-in-law has to get rid of it now. So you come in and say, well, I'll give you 20 bucks for it. Oh, 25? Okay, yeah, 25 over 25. And when you take it home, first thing that I do is I look at the end of it. If there aren't three plugs, three prongs on the end of it, snip, $2 plug from Harbor Freight. There's a reason that that third plug is there. The operators didn't care because a lot of them were in buildings that were built in the 50s. And instead of having three plugs or three prong holes, they have two prong holes. Easy fix. Snip. Okay, we're ready to go. But that's your ground line. I mean, if you look inside a video game, you will see the, the braid that's on it. That steel piece hanging down. Right. <laughs> and the reason that this is there is that this will take 200 amps. God forbid if 200 amps ever goes through one of these boxes, but if it does, you want this, and you want this attached to that third prong. You do not want the amperage or the voltage getting loose onto the control panel or, or any of the other components. So the first thing I do, snip that off, put a new plug on it. The second thing I do, is not go, all right, I'm ready to go and plug it in. I get my meter out, trace it back through to make sure that A, there is a fuse in the circuit. You'd be surprised how many times I've gone in and gone, all right, where's the fuse? Oh, there's where it used to be. Somebody just wired it up, put a wire nut on it, it's gone now, or even more, the, the best ones were the ones where they could take the fuse and they would wrap it in aluminum foil and then pop it back in. The, old, the equivalent of putting a penny in the, the old screw in fuse box. I mean, there's a reason those things are blowing people. I mean, they're a safety measure. They, they, 
you need to do something. So, you know, if you see anything like that, fix it first before you power it on or get your 100 foot extension cord out, run it out in the middle of your driveway and plug it in because if, when it catches fire, you want it out there, not in your, your garage. Unless it's his garage, then it's okay. <laughs> I don't think he heard me. Oh well. Uh, so just, just you know, practice safe electrical practices when you get these old machines because God knows what the guys have done to them. So I take the meter continuity test, make sure it goes to the fuse, goes from the other side of the fuse, goes to the line filter. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard after the line filter to, to test it, but if you're good up to that point, you don't have any shorts to ground, then I'll get my extension cord, take it out in the driveway and plug it in. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but once or twice a year, you hear of somebody who plugged one of these in and burned their house down. So, um, after that, before I plug it in, I'll make sure that I pull the, uh, the transformer plug off so that when I power it up, I can go through and test the voltages on the transformers. You know, I mean, these things are, are 30 years old. Transformers do short out and will occasionally give very interesting results. Not very often, but occasionally. So you want to make sure that you get the right AC power coming off the plug. Once I do that, then I'll pull the plug off the top, which is where it feeds into the boards, plug the transformer in, turn it on, and see what happens. Usually from about five feet away, I have a little, uh, one of the power strips that has a 15 amp circuit breaker on it. It's on a, on a circuit that has a 20 amp circuit breaker on it. So I could stand about five feet away, watch it, turn it on. If something happens, it'll short the, the circuit breaker on the, the power or on the power strip rather than having to go in the house and turn the, the breaker off. Um, and surprisingly, uh, everybody thinks I'm crazy for doing that, but about every fourth machine will trip one of the two breakers. Once we get that going, and I see on these, the old Defenders, they had the three lights, the new ones, same three LEDs. One of these days I'm going to find the right color LED. Apparently they have changed the, the formulation on them and I can't find that exact color. So when I rebuild one of these, if one of the LEDs is out, you know, snapped off or whatever, I'll just replace all three because I used to just put a new one in and then somebody went, oh, there's something wrong, it's too bright on this one. I mean, these are people that, you know, so I just, I just replace all three just so they're all the same intensity, the same color. Lately I've been swapping the red ones out for green ones. Uh, I got lucky on an auction buying there were a couple of uh, old parts and the guy was bundling a whole bunch of stuff together and he bundled like a thousand green LEDs with part of this bundle. So I don't know what else to do with them. So I've been using them for that. I've been building little test rigs with all these LEDs on them and stuff. I've got a lifetime supply. Anyway, if you get the three LEDs on, that is not a guarantee that your power is correct. All that means it's above the threshold. It might be way above the threshold, it might be right on five volts, or it might be just barely over the threshold to turn on. So again, take your meter out, run it across the power, make sure that you're getting the right power out of those. Um, and then it's time to start looking at whether or not to rebuild it. These headers take a lot of current. One of the things to look for on them is, are they discolored? What ends up happening is, the, as electricity goes through this stuff, it heats up. When it heats up, it oxidizes. When it oxidizes, it gets a little more resistance. When it gets a little more resistance, it gets a little hotter. It gets a little hotter, it oxidizes faster, gets a little more resistance, 
we have this positive feedback loop and eventually it will literally get hot enough to melt the, uh, the nylon and you'll see it scorch marked and, and if it gets hot enough it will actually weld the, the metal uh, pins right onto these headers. I mean I get, I get them sent to me where people said I'm sorry I couldn't get, a, get the connector off so I just cut the wires because it, it was welded right down onto the pins. Normally it's the, the ones down on this end on these power supplies because that's where the, the voltage comes in to drive the 5 volts. Again, most systems are very 5 volt intense so that's where all the current comes through. That's why if you look at the switching power supplies you'll see the 5 volt is like 15 amps. You know, the other ones are like 1 amp, 3 amps, something like that. All the, all the amperage is coming through on the 5 volt. So once you look at that, the next thing to do is to look and see do you have one of these on it or do you have one of these on it? About 90 percent of the big bridge rectifiers, that's part of the 5 volt system, that has one of these on it, you're good to go. I, less than 10 percent of those I've ever found have, been, have failed. These little guys, and I'll pass this one around. If you notice at this end of it, I just touched it. That's the side of it. It's just plastic. It just peeled right off. So, actually I'm not gonna pass it around. You guys don't wanna get your fingers dirty. But you can tell, because these will have big globby marks where the the plastic is melted or it will do this where a big piece of it comes off. If you see that, replace it. Um, the place that I get them from is called Great Plains Electronics. They're not the only place, but these are 35 amp, uh, 200 volt I think is the minimum. From Great Plains I get 35 amp, 400 volt and they have a metal plate on the top so they run a little bit cooler and if you want to be really paranoid about it there's actually uh, heat sinks you can get that will screw right onto the top to help keep it cooler or you can get the popcorn popper attachment. Um, the other, while well, I'm on the topic of Great Plains, it's the only place that I know of that you can get exact replacements for these 18,000. Ed goes out, the owner of GPE, and he actually has, I think it's uh, Nishiban, whoever, somebody, one of the big big capacitor makers, and has them custom made. And he actually sells about a reasonable, reasonable price, I think about $6.95 or something like that. The other option is, if you know anything about capacitors, you know that you can gang them up. So you can get two 9600s or uh, four 4600s. It's just, I should have brought one of those. I didn't, I had one, I should have brought it. They really look ugly when you get four big old capacitors just sitting on top here. It'll work, it just looks really ugly. I mean, you may be the only one who knows about it because your cabinet's closed and nobody goes poking their nose in it. Um, and that's perfectly acceptable. I mean, I know some people get all, oh, don't do that. It works great. I mean, these things are low voltage, so you always hear about capacitors drying out. If you've done monitor cap kits, you know, they say, oh, everything dries out. Well, really, it's only the high voltage stuff that gets heated up. These, I found, 30 years old, they test perfectly, just the same as they do the day they were shipped. Now, if you see that yours you know, has a big bulge on one end, um, or you'll see cracking around the edges, if you've got an ESR tester, test it. If you don't and it shows any sign of damage, replace it. Um, because otherwise it won't give you that protection when the power goes down just won't have the capacity anymore. Um, let's see. Uh, 
I'm losing my train of thought. Usually you guys can chime up and ask us to, to talk about things. So I think everybody's not awake. You were all out at the uh, smoker last night by the pool. I'm tired today. But um, let's see, what else about power? Have you guys got any questions about what I've, what I've been running over so far? Or? Tell me something about the program. The programming. Uh, just to just completely switch topics, right? Completely, that'll work. That'll work. Um, programming was uh, interesting. All the programming for all the Williams video games back in the 80s was done using assembler language. It was all machine code. Um, the way it worked for us, and, and I've heard from several of the other shops, Tato and some of the others, that they worked similarly. We had a VAX. Everybody connected to the VAX. They had a cross compiler. It would compile the code down to 6809 code. Um, all of the Williams video games were 6809. The pinballs for a long time until they got to the WPCs were 6800. One chip level down. 6809 was the bridge between 6800 and the 68000. It had some 16 bit registers in it. Uh, it had some some interesting instructions that the 6800 didn't have. And so what we did was we wrote it all in, in assembly. The, the first person, the way we did projects um, was that somebody would come and they would pitch their idea. I want to write a game about this mutant who shoots everything in sight. Cool, go for it. So then you had three months to put a prototype together. That, you might get an artist, you might not, you might get part of an artist, but you would have to have something. You would have to be able to show some elements of gameplay. Obviously you don't have to show 87 levels of it, you just have to show you know, what it's gonna look like. The executives at all, uh, and go E or E, right? depending on whether they liked what was going on. At that point, you got more resources. You actually got an artist that's assigned to your project. You may or may not get a second programmer assigned to your project. That's how I got started, uh, sort of. Um, I was originally hired to do the ports to the Atari cartridges because I was a 6502 assembly program. And uh, the week that I was hired, they entered into a contract with Atari for Atari to do the ports. The first port was Defender, followed by Joust, and then uh, Robotron. And so it was like, stop, whatever you're doing, don't do it. After about a week of that, I was like, play me or trade me, let me do something. So I went down to the art department and started working on their list, laundry list of things to do with your art system. The art system was actually based on the same boards, but it had alternate software in it so that you use it to create the characters and you create several frames of them and then animate them and you can write to get the timings right for the animation. So I rebuilt the art system. About that time, Mystic Marathon was looking for a second programmer. <laughs> Please let me do something. I get bored easily. I am the poster child for ADHD, which is why I've got 87 projects at home all the time, because I'm a serial project person. Um, so I joined Christina and uh, Jan Hendricks, who are the, Christina was the programmer. Actually, Mystic Marathon is probably the only classic video game that was ever programmed by a woman. Everybody says Centipede, but the woman who was on it was actually the designer, not a programmer. It was all men that programmed it. So Mystic Marathon is sort of a, a unique little, little niche trivia answer. Um, anyway, I joined the team. A week after we joined the team, somebody came down and said it was called Monkey Marathon at that point. It was monkeys running across islands. And uh, the, the, we just got, got word from our spies over at Atari that they're coming out with a monkey game, so you can't have a monkey game. Uh, you got a week to come up with a new theme. <laughs> mm. 
am I the kiss of death here or what? So we're, we're sitting around. Uh, one of the, the other programmers I'd loaned him a book called A Spell for Chameleon, the Xanth series by Piers Anthony. And he was returning the book while we're in the middle of this, this oh my god, brainstorming session. And we were going nowhere and somebody said, well, what's that about? And he goes, well, it's about this magical land full of puns. Really? So from that, we crystallized the, the theme for Mystic Marathon. That's why you have things like the helping hands and the holes that move forward and you know, all the weird little things that were in there. Uh, but that's how the design process worked. And then you would, you would go off and you would program the animations and, and, and the actions. The first thing that you had to do was come up with an operating system or an operating environment. It's not really a system. So that all of the things could flow and that, that you could react to events. They're very event driven. You know, it's, it's, nowadays it's called event driven program. But every time you hit the joystick forward, it would trigger an event. You hit it left, it triggers an event. You hit a button, it triggers an event. So all these events are being processed. And that's why I say originally, you know, it's my privilege to work with these people that, I mean, they're doing stuff that people can't do now. They're doing it in assembly. You know, I mean, it's, it's really, really low level type stuff. So, that's basically, I don't know if that answered your question yeah, or, or, or obliterated no, it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, there was a lot of pressure because we would get these three month points where we had to show something. And if, if they liked what they saw, it would continue. If not, you were disbanded and you had to work on something else. You had to have a whole proof of concept wired up and running, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. usually by about six months, you could actually sit down and play a couple levels. And by nine months, it had to be ready to ship. And they had several teams going all at once. While I was going, the, the Joust team was just finishing up. They are fixing a few last, last minute bugs. Sinistar team was going, the Splat team was going, um, I'm trying to think what else, Bubbles was going at that time. Uh, the, two, the 1983 AMOA show was where Sinistar, Bubbles, Mystic Marathon, um, I think Joust Pinball, and Star Rider all debuted. And then shortly after that was followed by the, the great 1983 Amway Massacre. Uh, that was a, an aborted attempt to sell Williams to Bally. And uh, so as part of that, they, they asked, Bally asked that Williams make their balance sheet look better. How do you make your balance sheet look better in a short period of time? You, 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 and you, out of the pool. So he called, the CEO called back to one of the, the vice president and said, we need to fire a third of our staff. So they did, across the board. And so when he got back and went over to Bally, the CEO of Bally told him, you've got to be kidding. We didn't, we wanted you to make your balance sheet look better, but we want your intellectual property. That means your programmers. And you fired a third of them. You're an idiot. Get out of here. So that deal fell through. Later, Williams bought Bally, or actually Midway, but that was a whole nother. Later on, after uh, uh, a number of other Mortal Kombat and all of those. So, um, you know, it, it, was a, it was an interesting environment. It, Chicago was really a hotbed of it because you had Williams, you had Tato, Stern. Um, Atari had a small research staff who was mainly there to, to try and spy on everybody else. Um, Electronic Arts had a big development center there because when, when the video game industry imploded in 83, 84, they picked up a lot of the video game programmers and got them doing cartridges for them. Um, so it was, a, it was a very, very interesting time. I, you know, I would have loved to have stayed in it, but unfortunately I had bills to pay. So I went out and got an industry job. I tried a few times to get back into it, but uh, there was always the, the golden handcuffs. Well, we'll be happy to pay you $10,000 a year and royalties. Hey, I've been down that road before. 
you know, royalties are, are non-existent until you know you see what happens. But uh, so it was. It was an interesting time. Um, I think we should probably have a moment of silence for Williams because they were just sold to the scientific games a couple weeks ago. What was left of them? Uh, WMS Industries was uh, acquired by a, a lotto machine manufacturer who wanted to expand their their uh, casino stuff into the slot machines and so on that WMS, which used to be Williams, has sort of gone into. Um, I've heard quite a few of the, the last survivors over there got the axe because of that. Again, they just wanted the intellectual property, not the people. So, it's, a, it's kind of sad, it's the end of, a, end of an era, even though it really was over in the late, late 80s, early 90s. Um, oh, I don't know if, I, I probably have enough for you guys. One of the things that I, I use when I'm rebuilding the power supply is a little worksheet that I put together. It shows all the test points and what the voltages should be. And then has the schematics and the uh, parts layout so I don't have to go scrounge my book up every time. I have this as a PDF file so I just print them out and go through it. I've, I've brought, I don't know, 14 or 15 of them if you guys want to grab them. And, do you have to go digitally online? I don't have any place to stick a PDF file. I mean, if any of you have a website, you know, give me a business card or an email address, and I'll be happy to email it to you. Um, let's see, you know, put running down on time, but still not quite out of time. Um, the other thing I have, if you haven't gone over and picked up, this, this is the plug part of it, the game preserve. Um, if you're in the Houston area, Primarily, because obviously people aren't going to drive from Austin or Dallas to come down here very often. But uh, we have a what we call the, the Houston's only members only or membership sponsored arcade. We're looking at business models and watching. Hey, that guy opened an arcade. Oh, it's gone. Well, that guy opened an arcade. Oh, it's gone. They just can't suck quarters enough to make it anymore unless there's a, a specific set of circumstances. Pinballs can because they're a destination. They have so many pinball machines and that if redemption games. They yeah, well, that's off redemption games. Yeah. Well that I don't even consider that an arcade. Right. That's not that's not a game. That's that's just uh, you're you're you are subsidizing whoever <laughs> owns that machine. Um, go go and take a look at the operating on the claw machines. You'll find that there's a setting in there for the strength. Yeah. So like one every once every seven times or once every nine times, there's enough strength to actually pick something up. You'll put it down and it doesn't clamp it and just goes. And you think, oh, I almost had. It. No, you didn't almost have it. You weren't even close. And so hey, that's why I say that you are you are just you might as well just open your wallet and just give it to the guy because the chances of getting anything is so small, it's, it's ridiculous. Sorry, time out, return from personal opinion. No, we're, we, we have classic arcade games. We don't have any redemption machines. We've got about 40 video games and about 20 pinball machines. We're in the process of moving to a larger facility where we'll have much better space. It's actually air conditioned. We were in an office warehouse this year. And it was good in the spring, and it's good right now. But there were a couple months in there where we just there was just no way we could keep it cool. Um, but it's it ends up being more of a social thing on weekends, Saturdays especially. It's kind of funny. We get 35 people, and there'd be two people in playing games, and 30 some people out in the parking lot swapping stories or fixing whatever machine somebody drove up with, or you know. But it's it ends up. As a, as a fun thing, we're doing a pinball tournament now. Um, we'll be doing a, a, another pinball tournament, in, or actually I should say a pinball league now. We'll be doing a pinball tournament in December, uh, hopefully once we're moved. i got to change the date on that, because I think the date that I had was like the first weekend in December, and, and that's probably going to be moving weekend, so that won't work too well. Yeah, I play this machine before it goes out the door, okay? <laughs> uh, 
But if you're in the Houston area, you know, please stop by. We have a website, uh, www.gamepreservehouston.com. We'll give you the address, the current address, and uh, any of the operating hours, whatever else. Um, you got a Facebook. What's that? You got a Facebook. Yes, yeah, there's a Facebook. That, right? Yeah, yeah it's on the it's on the brochure. I don't Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, That's how I see all y'all's updates. Actually, yeah. This is the Facebook. Yeah. Well, I'm. I'll try and do the PC version. I'm on Fu Book, <laughs> the anti-social <laughs> network. Um, it just. I've seen what it's done to my wife. It's like. <laughs> should be about on a Saturday at about one o'clock in the afternoon. So. Can I plug my phone in? Why? It's dead. Well, that's because you've been Facebooking all day. I'm not. Not all day. Why is your battery dead? <laughs> so, no, I, I just... I, I don't have enough time to, to spend keeping everybody informed of where I am and what I'm doing. Not that anybody would care. So, I just... I haven't gotten into that. I guess I'm, I'm a Luddite. Put me in with my old video game machines and I'm happy. I mean, I don't like those controllers, man. I, I've got a uh, PS3. I've got like two games for it. And by the time I figure out that it's a square button, the round thingy, pull back on the lever, somebody's blown my head off anyway. So, <laughs> you know, give me a joystick and a button, man. I am a god, but give me one of those controllers and I am dead meat. I just don't have the time to sit in it like the kids do. And, oh, yeah, yeah, if you do this and you do that and you go behind your head and round it back and then, look, see what it did? Uh, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> give me a joystick and a button, I'm happy. So, but anyway, um, I'll be around the rest of the weekend. Yeah. If you have any questions, you want to chat about anything, you know, feel free, just grab me. As long as I'm not in the middle of a really good game of pinball, just hold back till I'm done. I don't get very many of those. So if I'm on a good run, just let me go. <laughs> okay. But thanks, everybody. Um, like I said, I've got, I'll put these up here if you want the hard copy. Um, if the arcade repair guys want to put it out on your website, Thank you're free to use it. Um, I don't think Williams will care that I'm putting their schematics up anymore. <laughs> now scientific games. Um, but anyway, like I said, enjoy. That's what this is all about, is, is playing with these magnificent old beasts and trying to keep them healthy and running. Hopefully if helped you a little bit, and if not, just read the stuff I put on KLOV, you find me <laughs> in the repair section all the time. So, thanks everybody. Thanks.